I think at the technical level, uh, the lectures will be completely independent. <coughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. But uh, so uh, but I maybe just say a few words to recall what we did in the previous lectures. So w we considered the energy critical nonlinear wave equation in the focusing case. And the, the goal is to understand uh, the asymptotics, the long time asymptotics for large solutions. Okay, that's the general goal. Then I, I, I've heard, oh, I'm sorry. So I started by uh, describing the, the work uh, with uh, Frank Merrill in which we proved what we call the, the ground state conjecture, so that if the energy is smaller than the energy of the ground state, which we call W, which is a radial solution of the elliptic equation, and is the uh, minimal energy solution among non-zero solutions, then uh, there's a dichotomy if the H1 norm of the data is smaller, then the one of W, you have global existence and scattering in both time directions. And if the H1 norm is bigger, you have a finite time blow up in both time directions. And the case of equality is ruled out by variational considerations. So that was the first result that I uh, described. And in doing so, we introduced this uh, concentration compactness rigidity theorem method that allows one to reduce the thing to proving that certain solutions with a compactness property uh, do not exist. Okay? And in that, I want to point this out because it will be interesting from the point of view of my lecture on Wednesday. Uh, one crucial point was that there are no cells similar uh, blow-up solutions which are compact. And the proof of that introduced self similar coordinates. Okay, and we will see that revisited tomorrow, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, then after that, we started with a general study of type two solutions. And uh, so type two blow up solutions are solutions which uh, cease to exist in finite time, but have uniformly bounded norm in the energy space. And uh, as I was saying, this uh, is a phenomenon which is very characteristic of energy critical situations. And the first examples were constructed by uh, Krieger, Schlag, and Tataro in the three dimensional case. And then uh, Hilaire and Raphael constructed solutions in the four dimensional case and Gendrange in the five dimensional case uh, of this kind of solution. So, we're talking about a non-empty set of objects. And then uh, we introduced the soliton resolution conjecture, which gives a precise description of the asymptotics of solutions which remain bounded until their final time in the energy space. And the description is that asymptotically a solution looks like a finite sum of rescaled uh, traveling waves plus a radiation term, that's the solution of the linear equation, plus a term that goes to zero at infinity as, t as time goes to the final time. Uh, and then the last thing that we did uh, in the first sequence of lectures was to prove this result for the radial case. Okay? And the proof in the radial case uh, boiled things down to a dynamical characterization of the only uh, radial elliptic solution, which is the ground state. And uh, that was what we call the channel of energy argument. We showed that all uh, solutions of the nonlinear equation that exist for both positive and negative time create a channel of energy outside the light cone unless they are a rescaled up. Okay, and from that we could prove this solid and resolution conjecture. So that's the summary of what we did before. 
Okay? So now we continue. So the subject of this week's lectures is the non-radial case. Okay? All right. Ah, I was going backwards. Okay, so uh, in the non-radial case, uh, some new difficulties arise because now we uh, we have to deal with all the traveling wave solutions to the equation, and uh, we've proven already, and we saw that uh, in the last series that the traveling wave solutions are precisely Lorentz transformations of uh, elliptic solutions. But when we're in the non-radial case, there are many elliptic solutions and there's no classification of them. So in the, in the radial case, we have an explicit uh, radial solution. There's a formula for it. It's 1 over 1 plus x squared over 6, the whole quantity square root. So I mean, we have very specific information. Now the general solutions to the elliptic equation have many flavors as far as we know, and they're not classified at all. Okay? So we have a very large uh, set of traveling waves. The second thing is in, in our dynamical characterization of W, we used a certain uh, outer energy inequality for radial solutions of the three-dimensional wave equation. Now that corresponding estimate fails in the non-radial case. So that's uh, a, so a different approach is needed. So uh, we believe that an approach that is purely based on uh, dynamical properties of the traveling waves, since this is such an um, unwieldy and large set of objects is unrealistic. So we're going to proceed in a different way. Okay. So let me st state the result that we're going to be uh, describing. Uh, so we take a solution that remains bounded in the, in the energy space. So let's assume that first that T plus is finite. And let S be the set of singular points. So a singular point is a point where there's energy concentration. And we showed that the set of singular points is always non-empty and finite in the case when the blow-up time is finite. Okay? So we fix an element in the, uh, among the singular set. And then the result is that there's a number, j star, which is bigger than or equal to 1, a little radius, r star. This radius has the, the role that it separates all the singular points, so that you're staying away from the other singular points. Okay? And a time sequence Tn, which converges to T plus. And this is a well-chosen time sequence. It's not an arbitrary time sequence. And here is a main difference between this result and the radial result. In the radial result, we were able to prove this for all sequences of times. Okay? So there's a well-chosen sequence of times so far. A, a scales lambda Jn, which go to zero faster than the self-similar rate. Positions Cjn, which are strictly inside the ball of radius t star minus tn around x star for some beta which is strictly smaller than 1 and uh, directions lj which are given as the limit of the vector cjn over t plus minus tn and notice that because of this the limit after passing to a further subsequence is always well defined and it's always strictly less than one. And traveling waves, such that within this ball, we have the decomposition that our solution equals this radiation term, a fixed H1 cross L2 term, 
plus the sum of modulated solitons, so these are the traveling wave solutions, plus an error that goes to zero. And these uh, traveling waves don't see each other because of the orthogonality property of the parameters. Okay? So this is precisely the soliton resolution result along a well-chosen sequence of times in the finite blow-up case. Okay? Silly question. So your J star depends only on on what the the J star depends uh, basically on this on that supreme. So presumably for the same J star you could have another sequence of times with Possibly. different rates Possibly. for the same J star. Yeah, for the same J star. Thank you. <coughs> okay, yes. Sorry, Carlos, I'm confused about R star. Where is the R star in the, in the final state line? Is that the, this holds inside BR? Ah, I see, I see. Okay, so it just separates the different uh, singular points. Okay, so that they don't see each other. That's the purpose of this. Okay, other questions? Okay. Now comes the other possibility, which is that there's an infinite time of existence. Then there's the radiation term, which is a, a solution to the linear equation that extracts the most scattering you can have in the U. So it's what we call the scattering profile. Okay. And what it does is outside any finite distance from the uh, light cone, the difference between U and this linear solution is zero. Okay. Then there's also numbers j star. Now here we are allowing j star to be zero, and that would be the case when the solution actually scatters. Uh, a time sequence, which is well chosen, going to infinity, scales on the jn, which are much smaller than the self-similar rate, positions, which are strictly inside the light cone, uh, directions lj for the traveling waves, and traveling waves such that the solution equals the linear solution plus the sum of modulated traveling waves plus an error that goes to zero at infinity and then these traveling waves do not see each other because of the orthogonality property. Okay, And here there's no R star because there's only one infinity. Okay. So this is precisely what one would hope to prove. Of course, one would hope to prove it for all sequence of times Tn's, but for now we have it for one sequence of times. That's well chosen. That's an optimistic state for now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the let me just go on. Yeah, the, the, the lambda j's are less than Tn, that means that some of these uh, traveling waves may, sc may, may, may scatter? No, 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 they are concentrated. Yes. They concentrate faster than the light cone. They, they are dividing. I mean, they, they can open, but not as far as the, white, the light cone that goes to infinity now. Because norm of Q is uh, infinity, huh? so, yes. so, 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 so none of them are scattering. Yeah. And then everything happens strictly inside this light cone. Okay, that's what we're saying. Okay. All right. So I will. If you remember what I did in the first part of the lectures, I proved the, the soliton resolution in the radial case for t plus equals infinity. So in the non-radial case, I'll do the finite case, just for variation. But the proofs are more or less the same. Once the scattering profile, and this is a typo, this should be a V sub L. Once we have the scattering profile, the, the two proofs are more or less identical. So what we're going to begin doing now is uh, show how to extract this scattering profile. That will be our first step. Once we do that, then we will 
uh, only work in the finite time case because the two things will be the same. But the extraction of the scattering profile is a highly non-trivial thing at this, at this level. Okay. So this is a work with Dukair and Merle uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, yeah, maybe I should have said, so this theorem is due to Dukair, Gia, myself, and Merle. Okay. So the J is how Gia. Okay. So to so uh, who is the scattering profile? Well, the, the thing that you do is you apply the linear group at minus t to the solution u. Then you take the weak limit of that and the solution corresponding to this weak limit. That's what the scattering profile is. And I don't know why in this page I'm calling it UL and in the previous one I called it VL, but they are the same. There's only one scattering program. So let's go on. Okay? So the, uh, l let me first summarize the proof. Okay. So the, the, the key, well, uh, I mean, just explain the idea, is that we're going to rule out any n block. So we know we have this idea of how to decompose a solution into blocks, which are nonlinear profiles in the bahuri girard profile decomposition. But I'm not going to go into details of what they are, more than that. So we, we're, we're going to see that there is no nonlinear block in your solution, which remains close to the light cone for very large time. And this is what should happen if you believe that the only nonlinear objects are these traveling waves. Because the traveling waves are, are traveling at, at speeds strictly less than one. So there can't be any nonlinear object that travels at speed one. And that's what this proof shows. Okay? And how do we show it? We show it by combining a family of formulas, which are called virial identities, which we saw in the previous lectures. Okay. So one tool that we use in, in, in this is actually uh, part of the theory of the linear wave equation, which was developed by Gerald Friedlander in the 80s, 70s, 60s and 50s, yes. And uh, somehow people working in uh, the Melrose School of, of scattering theory kept using this, but everybody else more or less forgot about this. And this turns out to be an important tool here. And we rediscovered it independently. But then we found out that Friedlander had already done this. So we will use the notation DDR for the radial derivative and 1 over R grad sub omega for the tangential derivative to the sphere. Okay? So these are more or less standard notations. Okay, so I'll give you the, th the linear theorem. This linear theorem allows to associate a profile at infinity to any solution of the linear wave equation. Okay, it says the following. Suppose we have a so any solution to the linear wave equation with data in the energy space. Okay, then always the, r the tangential derivative goes to zero as t goes to infinity. And the Hardy term goes to zero as t goes to infinity. The L6 term also goes to zero. The L6 norm. And there is a profile at infinity. There's a unique function g plus, which is an L2 of r cross Sn minus 1, such that the properly rescaled t derivative at infinity equals this object, and the properly rescaled r derivative at infinity equals this object. 
Furthermore, there's an isometry. The, ener the linear energy of this solution equals the L2 norm in R cross Sn minus 1 of this G plus. And the map that maps the Cauchy data to the G plus is a bijective biject isometry between the two spaces. And of course, there's a corresponding G minus as time goes to minus infinity. And this G plus and G minus are called the radiation fields associated to VL. So somehow there's a way to associate a profile at plus and minus infinity, which is an asymptotic state for any solution of a linear wave equation. Okay? And as I, I said, uh, we reproved this result not knowing that uh, Friedlander already had it. But then we found out that he did. So. Okay. So somehow one can use this, this objects to patch up together solutions of the wave equation coming from infinity. Okay, so this is how we're going to use this. Oh, yeah, I, I know. There's one more thing I want to mention here. Uh, there's a well-known property of solutions of the linear wave equation, which is what's called the equipartition of energy. That the spatial energy and the time energy asymptotically are the same. In fact, this shows a much stronger version of that, because this has a minus and this has the plus, and this goes to that, and this goes to that. Therefore, the equipartition of, of energy follows immediately from this. Uh, but it's a much, this is a much stronger statement than equipartition of energy. Okay? Okay. Oh, uh, by the way, at the end of this series, by Friday, let's say, afternoon, this notes will be posted on the IHES website. Uh, the first part is already posted in the IHES website. Okay? Okay, so, oh, uh, by the way, this was for all n bigger than or equal to 3. Now, everything else is also for all n bigger than or equal to 3, but I will only be working on R3. Okay? So, here's another typo. And I don't know if you have noticed, but there is a... Uh, there's a French notation and a, there's a U.S. notation. The French notation, the T comes first. And in the U.S. notation, the T comes last. And I've been using the U.S. notation. And then here I lapsed into French notation. I've been polluted by French collaborators. And, but it should be that the T goes second here. Okay? Okay, so now I, I, this, the Strickert's norm that we will be working with is the L, L5 in T, L10 in X norm. Okay? But we will localize it to sets of this form by taking first this spatial integral and then the time integral. And if we have a, an interval I, I will call S of I to be SR3 cross I. And then uh, if we have an F in L1 cross L2, you have a solution U, and it verifies the Strickert's estimate in terms of the L1 cross L2 norm. Okay? Is there any assumption of the dependence on, uh, of omega T on, on T? And measurable. Let, let's say... No, nothing geometric doesn't help? No. Well, we will, uh, uh, we will use it for uh, domains that have the dependence property, okay? But in, in this definition, there's no need for that. 
but it will always uh, be in, in case of a finite dependence property. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then there's a little claim here, is that you have a solution like that, then in fact asymptotically it looks like a free solution without any f. And that's the same proof as the proof of scattering in the in, in standard situations. Okay. And I will use this in this proof. Okay. Okay. So now I will sketch the proof of the uh, of the extraction of the scattering profile. So first, I take the uh, I choose any sequence going to infinity, and I choose a weak limit. Okay. This I can always do because this thing is bounded. Okay, and now the, I will call VL the linear solution corresponding to this weak limit. And what I want to show is that this limit holds. Now notice that really I want to show this for A negative. Because if I know it for some A, I will know it for any bigger A. But it's convenient for me to state the result as saying that it holds for all A real, as you will see in a second. Okay. So uh, if A is negative, that covers the, the line code. No, it's uh, moved up. It covers the outside, but moved up. Okay. All right. Uh, and if I know it for A negative, I know it for A positive. Because of continuity, obvious. Okay. So now I'm going to assume that this does not hold. And I'm going to reach a contradiction. So the first claim is that there is an optimal A bar for which the thing holds. So there is an A bar such that if I'm above it, my desired property, which is that uh, this uh, space-time norm is fine, it holds. And that for all A bigger than A bar, this behaves as if it were a linear solution, so this should be zero. And that for all A bigger than A bar, this desired limit holds. And this A bar is optimal because this norm is infinite. Okay? So I'm going to prove this. And it's in, in this statement that it's convenient that I'm working with all R instead of just with negative R. Because the sketch of proof of this, I define a bar as you would normally do it. Uh, you take the infimum of the good A's, but you have to show that the set is non-empty. Now the set is non-empty because if A is very large and positive, uh, this is certainly finite because if I chop up the data, it will have small norm and then it will coincide outside a, a light cone with something that scatters. So then this will be true. And that's the reason for, for doing this. Okay? So this set is certainly non-empty. And uh, clearly for any A bigger than A bar, this thing is finite by definition. Now this A bar could be real or could be minus infinity. Right, I mean, I probably, I don't know that it isn't. The fact that I'm assuming that the theorem does not hold forces this to be real. And that is how we will reach a contradiction. Okay? Because if this is minus infinity, this would hold for all A, and that's precisely what I'm trying to prove, so. Okay? So, now let me show the second uh, hypothesis, the second conclusion. So let A be bigger than A bar, and now I'm going to concoct a, a solution of an inhomogeneous problem, I will call it V, and what it will have is U chopped off at X bigger than T plus A, U to the fifth. 
Okay? So that this, by assumption, is in L1, L2, because A is bigger than A bar, and this norm is finite. Then. So since this is an inhomogeneous term in L1 cross L2, we have a linear solution that has this property. That was the first statement that I made that was just like scattering. Okay? Now, by finite speed of propagation, u has to equal v outside the light cone, because outside the light cone, both u and v verify the same wave equation. So then, in that previous statement, I had a v, I can put a u in here, in this region. And since u equals v, and for linear solutions, these terms go to zero, the same is now true for u. Now I will show that this VL of A minus the desired VL goes to zero, and this will finish the proof of two. Okay? Now how do I prove that? I will just say it. I look at the associated radiation fields. The radiation field associated to V sub L and the one to V sub AL. They they are both linear solutions, so they always have radiation fields. And now, what one can check by the definitions and, and a little bit of patience is that for any direction in S2, as long as I stay away from A, the two radiation fields coincide. And since the two radiation fields coincide, and one is approaching its own radiation field, and so is the other one, the difference has to be small in exactly the region that I want. So th this proves this, uh, this first two properties. Now I, I still have to prove uh, four. Yeah, no, I, I have also three. So now I have to show that this, the Strickert's norm at A bar is not finite. So if it were finite, then I could make it small by moving the t high, right? Because it's, a no, it's an integral norm. Then, because this is a well-defined a well object and it's completely linear at this point, if this is small, I can make it smaller. I can still give up a delta 1 over 2. So here I get delta 1 over 4. Then I get a delta 1 over 2. Then I get a delta 1. And then from this, if delta 1 is very small, I can conclude for the nonlinear solution the same thing. But this is a contradiction to the definition of A bar. Because I have a smaller thing for which the thing is fine. So that's how one concludes that the norm is infinite. Okay. Okay. Now, so now I've got a, a lemma that tells me what's happening with this A bar, but this is a completely uh, radial lemma. In order to conclude here, I have to now chop up into the different directions. So I'm going to define the set of regular directions and the set of singular directions. Okay? So let me first define what I mean by a regular direction. So I have a regular direction if I can go a little bit below a bar provided that I stay in a sufficiently small angle. Okay? So in this direction I can go a little bit below. And that's what I will call a regular direction. And a direction which is no, this is the, the usual angle, and a direction which is not regular is singular. Okay? So the, the main result about this setup is that the set of regular directions is non empty but finite. Okay? So this is our first step, and then we will obtain a contradiction by showing that it has to be empty that if this A bar 
was finite, the set of regular directions has to be empty. Okay, so that's the structure of the proof. So the main tool in proving the fact that the set of regular uh, directions is non-empty and finite is this statement. There is a delta 2 such that if omega satisfies that for some epsilon positive this linear object has smaller than delta 2 norm and what's important here is that I'm allowing the region to go below a bar and I'm keeping the angle small according to this t and the square root of t comes on the curvature okay so the statement is that if this is small enough but not arbitrarily small there's a fixed threshold then the thing has to be uh, regular okay so that's the 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 tool that we use to prove that the singular set is non-empty and finite. So let me just say this claim is not difficult to prove using the compactness of the sphere, the, the previous proposition and Strickert's estimates with uh, elementary geometric arguments and finite speed of propagation. Because this will show, suppose that uh, there is no point that is singular. Then every point is regular and this satisfies. This is satisfied. Then I cover my sphere by finitely many points where this holds and then because of that I can go slightly below a bar. So there has to be at least one singular point. Why do, do I have to have finitely many? Because uh, if I am bigger than this delta over 2 if I'm singular, I have to be bigger than a fixed delta over 2. And if I have infinitely many points, the deltas over 2 get too many. Okay? I, they get multiplied by a large number for any largeness. So this is the proposition, and this proposition is not so difficult to prove, but we will, we will use it. Yeah. So now we come to the... the heart of the matter, which is to show that this singular set is empty. And this will give us a contradiction. Okay? So, at this point, you're pretty much stuck with having to use a profile decomposition. And I've tried to avoid discussing very much about profile decompositions, because whenever I do that in lectures, I see all eyes glaze over. Okay, so anyway, but here we need a profile decomposition. I, I recall what the profile decomposition is. I, if I have a bounded sequence in H1 cross L2, after passing to a subsequence, I can rewrite it as the sum of rescaled linear solutions, fixed linear solutions, plus an error. And this error has small Strickert's norm as I take more and more profiles. Okay. Now, th these are linear solutions, and associated to each linear solution, there's a scale, a translation parameter, and a time parameter. And associated with these objects and a linear solution, I can uh, find what we call the nonlinear profile, which asymptotically behaves like the linear profile at the sequence of uh, times over scales. Okay? And uh, the parameters, the scaling, translation, and time translation parameters verify orthogonality properties that allow us to keep the, the profile separate. And one of the consequences of this is that there's orthogonality properties for the profiles in the H1 cross L2 norm. Okay? So just keep these things in mind. And uh, so the, the first task is to find uh, properties of the fact 
of the singular set in terms of the profile decomposition. Okay. So I will call, I will have two profile properties, profile property one and profile property two. Okay. Profile property one deals just with the radial situation. There's not a, there's not a direction chosen here. Okay. It tells me that if I have a profile decomposition for this solution, for which the A bar is real, then there's no profile with the properties that the translation parameter xjn minus the time parameter at which I'm taking the profile decomposition stays further away than the A bar. And the same when I incorporate also the time parameter and the scaling parameters are all shrinking to zero. And this bar here is a typo. Okay. Now what I will post will have the typos because I'll just post the PDF file. But I trust that there are so few that you will remember. Okay. Or else curse me for it. Okay. Okay. So we will argue let, let me sketch the proof, which is very short. <coughs> we will argue by contradiction. Let's assume that the time translating parameter is always zero. Remember that uh, when we do a profile decomposition, we can reduce to a situation where the TJNs are either zero or TJN in absolute value over lambda JN tends to infinity. Okay, Th those are the three cases. Otherwise, by changing the profiles, you can always reduce to this case. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, in the last uh, series of lectures, I explained how there is a certain lack of uniqueness in the profiles that's uh, tied up to the possibility of making these changes. But that's the only lack of uniqueness in the profiles. Okay. Okay, uh, remember that these profiles are obtained as weak limits. And so the fact that this is the profile in the profile decomposition means that this weak limit gives me exactly the energy of the linear energy of the profile. Okay. And the definition of the scaled profile, the modulated profile, is this because Tjn is zero. Otherwise, we would have minus Tjn over lambda Jn here. Okay? So now I'm going to do this calculation. I do the gradient dot uj, and I know what this goes to, goes to this, which is positive because this is a non-zero profile. Now, because this profile is one which is concentrated in this region, right, I'm trying to, to prove that there is no profile different from zero. So I assume that it, there is, and I'm going to reach a contradiction. Okay? Because of this, because of this property, this integral is concentrated in that region. Now in this region, because this is, uh, there's an epsilon here. This is the property one. This is bigger than a plus two epsilon. There's an epsilon here. Outside a bar, I can replace u by this VL. We already proved that. So I do that and I still have a little o of one. But here now I can replace this region by the whole thing with VL, again, by this property here is where it's concentrating. So I get that. Now I can use the, the asymptotic properties of VL given by the, radiation, by the radiation field. And that will tell me that this integral actually goes to zero, because this is a linear integral. And using the radiation field, I will get that this is zero. So then this object on the one hand goes to this and on the other hand goes to zero. That's a contradiction. The uj had to be zero. 
Okay? So this is another way in which you use these radiation fields. You have a, a, a sequence of time tending to infinity, and then you have an asymptotics. Now then, there's the case when limit of Tjn over lambda Jn is infinity, and this is worked out here. The, here you use the, non, the radiation field associated to the Ujl, and then you get a contradiction in a similar way. Okay. Now we come to the profile property 2. Profile property 2 deals with a singular direction. And profile property 2 tells you the following. Suppose I have, uh, there, is a, there is a fixed number delta 3, such that if Tn goes to infinity and omega is a singular point, after extraction, I have a profile decomposition such that one of the profiles, which I'm calling U1, is substantial and it's concentrating around in the direction of omega. And the addition, so this is the, the spatial concentration, and it's in the direction of omega. In addition, the scaling goes to zero, and the time uh, translation, the, the time concentration is also going to zero. Okay? And this is because otherwise, if there wasn't any concentration of the, of the Strickert's norm in near this direction of omega, I would have a regular point. So since it's a singular point, there has to be something like this. Okay. Now the proof is uh, you use the first proposition and some geometric arguments, and you and you uh, obtain that result. Okay. So these are the preliminaries. Now we're going to get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is this proposition. Suppose u and a bar are as before and epsilon is given. Then I can find the sequence of times going to infinity and a, a, a number alpha positive such that I can make dx1 plus ddt plus ddx2 plus ddx3 concentrated along the e1 direction up to level alpha within epsilon. Okay, so I'm going to, and the interesting thing is that, okay, if I had just ddx1, ddx2, ddx3, and ddt, this would be much better, but I can't uh, hope for that much, but if I can add the ddx1 and the dd2, I can get it. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is show you how from this proposition, I can show that there is no singular element. There's no singular direction. And what I will do is I will show that this implies that E1, uh, that's tied up to this ddx1, and to the direction E1 in here, I will show that E1 cannot be a singular direction. But of course, since E1 is an arbitrary direction after rotation, that shows that the singular set is empty. And that will be the contradiction. Okay? So uh, in here, this lemma will be proved without using that E1 is a singular direction. I'll just prove this for the direction E1, and then prove that this implies that E1 cannot be singular. Yeah. But you can impose the, the choice of one because if you rotate the... Uh, yes, then I, I can, if I prove this, I can prove that none is singular. Yeah, I can prove this for any other direction. So I choose one, but it could be proved for any other direction. So for, for another direction, you would have a different sequence? Possibly. But I will show that I have this, this sequence of time, and this sequence of time gives me that E1. Any direction in the, on, on S2, you, you get a sequence. Right. And using that sequence, I can show that that direction cannot be singular. And the sequence depends on the, may yeah. depend on the direction. Yeah. OK. So let's use this. 
So that, that is okay. That's part of the logic here. Or the illogic, if you like. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's show that this implies that E1 cannot be a singular direction. Okay, and this is enough. And then, of course, I have to prove the proposition. And the proof of the proposition is the main part of the proof. Okay, so up to now, what we've been doing is uh, peeling layers so as to get to the heart. And this is the heart. Okay. Okay. So I'm now going to show how proposition 2 implies E1 does not belong to S. So I, I now have to do a little digression to do that. Okay, so I introduce a new norm on the energy space. So if I take a, a, a pair in the energy space, I, I define the E sub 1 norm to be G plus DDX1 L2 plus DDX2 plus DDX3. Okay, uh, let me first convince you that this is a norm. You, at first you could have of course, the triangle inequality is obvious, but what is not obvious, at least uh, without thinking for a second, is that if the norm of Fg is zero, Fg has to be zero. Okay, so let's show that. Suppose that the norm of Fg is zero. Then F has two partials that are zero, right? And it's in H1. Then the third partial has to be zero. Right? There can't be an H1 function that depends on only one variable. Okay, so then ddx1 is zero, but then because of this being zero, g is zero. So th this is a norm. Okay, so th okay. Now the, the interesting thing is that for the linear equation, we have two conservation laws, right? The first we have conservation of the energy, but we also have conservation of the momentum. And if we combine those two, you can see that this quantity is independent of t. Because what you are adding is 2 ddx1 uh, ddt, and that's the momentum in the direction of e1. Okay? So this is independent of t. Because of that, now we can plug this into the profile decomposition and we get a new Pythagorean expansion. So we, we have a, a profile decomposition and we have this Pythagorean e expansion. Because in, in proving this, all you use is the orthogonality of the parameters and the invariance under the flow. Okay, so this is this. Uh, Pythagorean expansion for the E1 norm. Okay. Then the next thing that we need is the following claim. Suppose somebody gives me a beta and an M. Then there's an epsilon such that if I have something in the energy space with bounded by M energy norm but very small E1 norm, then the Strickert's norm can be made as small as I like. Okay? So somehow being small in this norm forces the Strickert's norm to be small. So how do I prove this? Well, uh, I, I prove it by contradiction. If not, I have a sequence which is uniformly bounded whose norm tends to zero, and whose Strickert's norm tends to zero, right? This is what I need to prove. That's the same as this. To show that this is true, let's take a profile decomposition for this. Now, because of the uh, Pythagorean expansion, all the profiles 
have to be zero because this norm is tending to zero. Because each profile will have zero E1 norm. And the E1 norm being zero uh, means that the thing is zero. Therefore, I'm only left with a dispersive term in the, Pythagor in the profile decomposition. And the dispersive term has Trickert's norm tending to zero. So that's the end of the story. So that proves this. Okay? Is this clear? This statement follows because if this goes to zero, I have no profiles. And therefore, I have this. Okay? Okay. So now let me go to the proof that E1 does not belong to S. And now I need to recall for you profile property 2. The profile property 2 says that if I have a Tn going to infinity and an omega in S, then for some subsequence, this property holds, this property holds, this property holds, and there's a delta 3 which is substantial, okay? And the beta comes from this claim, that if I have a uniform bound, and this is smaller than epsilon, then this has to be smaller than delta, than beta, okay? So I have an M given by the supremum. I, I'll choose beta to be delta 3 over 2, where delta 3 is the thing that gives me the substantiality of the first profile in profile property 2, okay? By the proposition, I can find the sequence T prime n and, and alpha such that this limb soup is small. This gives me the sequence. From this sequence, I take a profile decomposition, verifying the properties of profile property 2. Okay? So now I'm going to show that the, the, this implies uh, the right smallness of the E1 norm. Okay? So since this is an inner product associated to this norm and we have the Pythagorean expansion for this norm, we also have this weak limit for the profiles. Remember, we, we used this before for the H1 cross L2 norm. We now can use it for the E1 norm. Okay? But we know by the profile property 2 that this that this profile is concentrated where this is less than alpha, so this part is small. Now I look at this inner product and I split it into this region and this region. In this region this is small. And in this region I get a bound of epsilon. Therefore I get this whole thing is bounded by epsilon plus something that goes to zero with n. But this gives me the E1, E1 norm squared. And that means that this thing has E1 norm less than epsilon. But if the E1 norm is less than epsilon, given the way I chose my betas, this means that the S norm of E1 is less than delta 3 over 2, because beta was delta 3 over 2. But the property 2 said that it had to be bigger than delta 3. And so that's the contradiction. So this tells me that all I have to do is prove proposition 2. And that is the heart of the matter. Okay? And the next hour will be spent in proving proposition 2. All right? So is the logic at least clear? Of course, some of the calculations you have to do at home. But, <laughs> but this is the outline, okay? 
So proposition two is, is the, the important thing. Given epsilon, we can find the sequence T prime n and an alpha such that this limb soup is less than epsilon. Okay, this is our task. That was proposition two. Okay. You can trust me that this was proposition two. Okay, so let's prove this. And this is the thing that is proved using virial identities. This is the heart of the matter that shows you that things cannot be traveling at speed one so near, the, near the light core, okay? Okay, so now we start a different uh, chapter in this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to produce some kind of a defect measure. Okay? So let tau n be any sequence of times tending to infinity. I will call rho of xt to be u to the 6 plus the gradient. This is an e1, not an epsilon 1, squared, and then the Hardy term. So what, what the, what's this row representing? It's, I'm scaling the u at the singular point, And I'm doing it beyond a bar where things go wrong. OK? And then I have, I put in the, the linear en the energy, the linear energy. But I also throw in the L6 norm and the Hardy norm. Okay. For, for good measure. So the, the statement is that after we're given a sequence, after extraction I have a non-negative Radon measure such that the rho sub at time Tn goes weakly to this non-negative measure mu tilde, but the, the support of the u tilde has to be in x1 negative. Okay, less than or equal to zero. Okay, because, and that's where the, um, the fact that ome uh, omega is a singular, that uh, a bar is there, makes it be that way. Okay? Okay, the first statement is obvious, right? Because these are bounded. Bounded measure has a subsequence, a bounded sequence of measures has a subsequence that converges weakly. Nothing more to be said. So the important thing is the support. Okay? So, in proposition three, we showed that if I went an epsilon outside a bar, the u converges to the VL. If I go an epsilon tilde outside the A bar, the u can be replaced by the VL. And uh, by go using that the plane is outside the tangent sphere, this holds. The first statement is true. And these two statements were also true because these two quantities went to zero. So we just want to, to, to show the, the support. Uh, since the u equals the vl in, in this region, if I, cho if I choose that this is going to zero for any compacted supported thing, this has to be supported in a x1 less than or equal to epsilon for every epsilon and therefore in x1 less than or equal to 0. OK? So I'm going to show this. And this is now a linear solution. So what am I going to use? Now the point is that the times are going to infinity. So what am I going to use? The radiation field. OK, that's what I'm usually using. So this is what I have. This will be the radiation field. I first change variables, and now I change this by the radiation field and, and make a small error. 
Now I change variables here. And now because this has compact support, if omega is different from E1, this goes to zero. And therefore by dominated convergence, the thing goes to zero. Okay, I have two different directions and then one is going to infinity. I, I exit the support. Okay. All right. Now we have our, our defect measure mu tilde and I'm going to decompose it into a delta mass at the origin plus a remainder. And the remainder has the property that it charges the origin zero. <coughs> right? I, I had no way of knowing that this is an absolutely continuous measure. I don't gonna, I'm not going to claim that. Okay. So I just take the, the part corresponding to the origin and take the rest. Okay. So the next lemma says the following. Let Tn tend to infinity and epsilon be given. Then after extraction, there exist two non-negative random measures, mu0 and mu1, and two non-negative numbers, such that the mu0 and mu1 don't charge the origin. The rho at Tn converges weakly to mu0 plus C0 delta 0. The rho at Tn minus alpha over 10 goes weakly to mu1 plus C1 delta 0. The supports of the mu j's are in x1 less than or equal to 0. And here is the, the punchline. There's also an alpha and mu0 in the ball of radius less than alpha is smaller than epsilon and mu1 in the ball of radius 7 alpha over 10 is smaller than epsilon. Okay? Each one of these two things is obvious from the definitions. Because mu1 and mu0 charge 0 to the origin, so in a small ball the, the, they charge a small amount. The only point is that there is this uniformity that I can use a pro something proportional to the alpha in both cases. Okay? And so what will you use to uniformize things? There's only one thing you can do and that's use finite speed of propagation. Because here we're working with the wave equation and so by finite speed of propagation and small data theory you can see that you can make the same provided there it's because we are only alpha over 10 apart and we're allowing alpha in excess okay so that's where the, the wave equation plays a role, finite speed of propagation. Now, uh, there's an important fact here, which is an extra piece of information that this ta tells you, which is if we define rho of x t t n to be the same expression that you had before, where before you had t n, but now you put t, then for all t between tn minus alpha over 10 and tn, this will be smaller than 2 epsilon, provided you are always charging this annulus. Okay, uh, th so yes. So it, is this be, why do you need the same alpha, the same sort of... Uh, oh, because otherwise my, 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 my proof will not... Yeah, I need them to be comparable. Okay. It's because of the geometry of cones. Everything has to be. Any, any other question? Okay. Yeah. You have uh, some alpha over 10, 7 alpha over 10. I mean, presumably that means that the sum of the two should be, uh, should be something. And you yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. These, these are not uh, fixed. The point is you want to have them fixed and not dependent on t. Exactly. Yeah, the, the, that's, that's, the, that's the only point. So this property rho star shows you that uniformly in this range of Tn's and in this range of x's, things are small. Okay? 
So that's what we should take from this. Okay. Now we're going to review virial identities that we'd seen in the first part of the class, but I mean, of the course, but we'll review them. So, I don't know why this got there. <laughs> okay, so that's a typo. Uh, so little r is always the tail. This, these are the tails. Phi is a cutoff function, which is 1 for x less than 1 quarter and 0 for x bigger than 1. And phi sub r is phi scaled. Okay? Then we have this collection of identities. Okay, these are our virial identities. The first one tells us what x dot grad u times ddt u does when we take a ddt. We get this constant minus 3 halves plus a half grad u squared minus u to the 6. And then we have to take a, a cutoff function because x grows. And then there's an error and the error is bounded by the tail. Okay? The second one, oh, don't copy the second one. The plus should be a minus, that's a typo. Okay. Whenever the gradient squared and the u to the 6 appear, they have to appear with opposite signs because we're in the focusing case. Okay, so this is a minus. So then the other variable is where we have u d d t u. And then we have the same type of thing, but with different numbers. Here is 1, and here's minus 1, and here is minus 3 halves, and here's 1 half. Then this virial is related, I don't know if it's a virial, this identity is related to the uh, invariance of the momentum. And it says that if you take the energy density and you multiply it by x, the derivative of that is the momentum. Okay? And we have to chop it off, and then we get the error. And we will also be using the two conservation laws. Okay? The, the derivative of the energy is zero, and the derivative of the momentum is zero. And of course, we will always be using also truncated versions of them. So if we put the phi sub r here, we get a little o, o of capital R, and so on. Okay. And how do you prove these things? You prove them by brute force, right? You multiply the equation for an, by an appropriate object, and you integrate by parts. Okay, it's so the usual multiplier method. Okay, so now I'm going to take a sequence T sub n tending to infinity. I'll call phi sub alpha what before I was calling phi sub r, but now I have an alpha. And it'll be convenient to define u sub n of x to be the, this uh, trans translated and scaled u. So our definitions and uh, our previous lemma gave us information about these UNs. This converges weakly to this. This converges weakly to that. And then there were the smaller than alpha things. Okay? And now I'm going to introduce four quantities. A sub n is the DDT truncated by phi alpha. B sub n is the gradient squared. C sub n is the u to the 6. And D sub n is dx1 times d dt, which is the first component of the momentum. OK? And they're all truncated by this, by this phi sub alpha. And then I will be averaging these quantities for t between tn minus alpha and t sub n. Okay? And I will be proving things about the averages 
And from proving something about the averages is how I will manufacture a, another sequence T prime n that comes from the average. Okay? And then the, the terms that are averaged have upper bars. Okay? Now I'm going to rephrase the virial identities and my information in terms of these quantities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the first one, well, the first virial was this. We have the phi alpha, we have, and this is a, an O of epsilon. This O of epsilon comes from that property star. Okay, remember the star was the thing that was uniform for T between Tn minus alpha over 10 and Tn. Okay, so that was the first virial where this is the uh, time derivative, this is the space derivative, this is the L6 norm. And this one is this, the second virial, where I take the time derivative, and then the coefficients are all 1, or minus 1. The third one was the, the derivative of the x1 times the energy density, which gave me the momentum. Here is x1 minus the momentum. Here is just in, in the x1, so I get the uh, e1 component of the momentum plus O of epsilon. This is the uh, constancy of the momentum truncated. And this is the constancy of the energy truncated. Okay? So, so that's what these this, uh, things are. And the capital O of epsilon is uniform in T. All right, so what I will do is uh, force algebraic relationships between these objects that come from my assumptions, okay? So since we're taking an average, and this is roughly constant, it's the difference between its average is smaller than epsilon, which is the pointwise difference, but then since I'm averaging, I get an alpha. And the same for the energy. Okay? Pardon me? Plus minus sign in the Ah, there's a typo. The this one is a plus. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Th thank you. Yeah, that's it, plus. Okay. So, now I'm going to prove three, three facts. Minus dn bar. So this tells me, the first fact is that in the situation we're in, the energy equals the momentum with a minus sign. That's what the first one says. The second one says that this, uh, this combination is almost zero. And the, the last one is that this combination is the mo momentum plus almost zero. So let me show you the, the proofs of this. I will only show you A, but you will see once I prove A how all the others go. They're very similar. Okay? So A relates the energy to the momentum. And why, how do I relate the energy to the momentum? Remember there's a, a, a relationship that the derivative of x1 times the energy density equals the momentum. That's what I will use. Okay? Okay. 
So I integrate that relationship between Tn and Tn minus alpha over 10. And then take the average. So I get minus Dn bar, the average of the momentum. And here I get minus 10 over alpha. That's, this is the x1 times the energy density at time Tn minus at time Tn minus alpha over 10. Okay, so this is the fundamental theorem. And this 10 over alpha is the length of the interval. Okay, so this is just the fundamental theorem. Should I go back to the identity that I used to get this? Yeah. Okay. It's this. <coughs> I take the integral between Tn and Tn minus alpha over, over 10, and then average, and I get this, and then I get this at the endpoints by the fundamental theorem. Okay, so that's what I have. Okay, so here, what will happen? What, I, I'll explain in words what happens. This guy will be small because I have it at Tn. And uh, it, this is a consequence of that star bound. In here, I have it at Tn minus alpha over 10, then I have to change the space uh, scaling to match. Th I have to make a space translation to match. When I make a space translation, I will get y1 plus alpha over 10. And now the y1 term will be small, and then the alpha over 10 term is the one that will give me the energy. Okay? So let me now do the calculation. The first term is this. Oh, I went backwards. I have to understand this quantity. I have the x1. And this is exactly phi alpha over x d mu 0 x in the limit. Now, it's important that I have x1 here, because x1 vanishes at the origin. And that's why I didn't get the delta mass at the origin in that convergence. Okay? And this is precisely less than epsilon over alpha. Right? That was one of the properties that this measure d mu 0 had. So that's why I get that. For the other one, I have to do this change of variables. So what I have is this, and I now I do that change of variables. And of course, x1 has a y1 part, and then a part with no y1, which is this one. And this one, is the one that gives me precisely, the, when I take the average, the, the average of, of the energy. And this one, now it's, everything is centered the right way, will give me epsilon alpha. Okay? So I have this. Of course, I have the energy, but I have it at the, at, the, at the wrong time. But the energy is roughly constant, so I can change the time. So I have it here, so I, I get this identity, but I can change the energy and I get it here. And this is precisely the first one of those identities, was what I called A. Okay? 
So now I'm going to add A and C. Okay. When I add A and C, I went too far. When I add A and C, I get BN bar minus AN bar minus two thirds CN bar equals capital O of epsilon. Now I add B to it. If you remember, B has BN minus AN, uh, and I think it's plus CN bar. So the AN minus BN cancels the BN minus AN. And what I end up is with the fact that C bar N is small, is O of epsilon. So then I plug this back to the, to the first thing, and this is small, so I can put it with the O of epsilon, and so I have this, one half a n plus one half b n bar plus d n bar is O of epsilon. But now let's remember what b n bar, b n and a n had. A n had the d d t squared, b n has the gradient squared, and they have the factor one half, and dn bar is precisely dx1 times ddt. So now I complete that into the square. And you see that that's precisely the E1 norm. The E1 norm has ddx1 plus ddt squared plus ddx2 squared plus ddx3 squared. So I just, com you know, so I get this. And that's what I want to show is small. That's my conclusion. I mean, this kind of expression being small. But it's average in time. So since the average in time is small, there has to be one sequence of times for which the thing is small. Okay. Yeah. And to here it was for every tn, so this is the first time that you... This is how you choose the t prime n, I'm passing from the average to the particular set of t prime n's. But as we saw in the proof that that ruled out that it was a singular point, any sequence was enough. It didn't matter that... So any sequence killed the set. Well, so, so now all that you have to do is see where the supports are and see that you have this. And that creates your alpha. Well, instead of alpha is alpha over 10, instead of epsilon is c over epsilon. But that concludes this proof. And as you see, I mean, it's uh, an elaborate proof. You, you cannot just sit down and do it. Okay. Yeah? Um, maybe, uh, no, no, you want to say? I just say we have the option of continuing, or if you're tired, we, ca we can stop for now and restart next time. Uh, maybe some, well, uh, since the proof, well, uh, okay, but continuing... Uh, uh, it will have to change subject. So maybe it's a good time to stop. Maybe more questions. If there are more because questions, bit, uh, th yeah, this is a big chunk to have swallowed. Yes. yes. People have to understand sequence of time depends on the point. Then you obtain a result for all time, but only in the. Yeah. In Can the you show, show show again the, the statement of the proposition? Yes. yes. The statement of the. It's better to go to. Uh, absolutely. No. No. I I have no. Questions. Yes. Yes. I I have no desire to to go on, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go back. First, the statement of the proposition.
the proposition is a bar is what we had, epsilon is given, then there is a sequence and an alpha such that this is small. Okay? So I think maybe what would be good is to review that this implies that E1 is not a singular point. I think that that would be... I saw a hand there. Yeah. I, I don't know if I misunderstood, but before you said that if you had the same proposition, that the elliptic sequence of times, but instead of having the dt, you had it like sum. You said that that would be better? Yes. Why? Because it would immediately kill all the profiles. Even if it's just you have along this subsequent, along this sequence. Yes, yes. Because for yeah, I, I think that's the thing that people uh, don't understand is as soon that you have it for a sequence, then you get for all time, but only in one special direction. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And you are working on all or, or one one spe direction. Yes, you have to work one direction at a time. Okay. Yes, okay. all these sequences depend on the direction. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. thank you. But the, the thing is that you're killing that direction. So you have a, some direction on your sites and you want to eliminate it. And to eliminate it, we find a sequence of time that has all these properties, but then that implies that that couldn't have happened. Okay? But let's go through the proof that this proposition implies that E1 is not a singular direction. Okay? Let's review. So we introduce this norm. And why do we introduce this norm? Well, let's go back to proposition two. It appears here. Right? And why does it appear here? As we saw in the proof of this uh, algebraic identities, this is the thing that appears naturally when you have the, uh, this virial identities and you see that the energy equals the momentum and so then you can combine them. And when you combine them, you get precisely this type of term. It was the one half ddt squared plus one half gradient squared plus ddx one ddt is exactly this. That would be zero on a function of t minus x one. Right. Okay. But of course, those functions are not allowed because they can't be in the space. Okay, so, so we introduce this thing as a natural object for our proof. Then the first observation is, again, you have to combine energy and momentum here. And because they are both uh, independent of time, this quantity is independent of time. Okay, so this is a constant thing that you're using the square, okay? And because this is time independent and we have the orthogonality properties of the parameters, this is, uh, immediately implies a Pythagorean identity for the profile decomposition, okay? And the proof is the same as the one for the usual energy. If you recall the proof on the usual energy, the only thing you need is that the energy is invariant. Okay? Okay. Then you're going to relate being small in this E1 norm to not having profiles, to having that the Strickert's norm is small. Okay? So this statement tells you that provided you have a uniform bound, if this norm is small, then this norm has to be small. So to prove that, what you're trying to show is that provided this is uniformly bounded, if this goes to zero, this goes to zero. Okay? So if this holds and this goes to zero, then this has to go to zero. This is what we need to show. To show that, we just take, so we have these two properties. And we're going to show that these two properties means, mean 
that there's no non-zero profile in the profile decomposition. Okay? Why is that? Because there's the Pythagorean expansion. So each profile squared is controlled in the E1 norm, is controlled by this E1 norm. And we know that if something has E1 norm that is zero, it is zero. That was the first thing that we showed, that this, this is a norm. And that's, so therefore all the profiles are zero from these two facts and the Pythagorean expansion. Once you have that all the profiles are zero, that means that only the remainder is in the profile decomposition, and the remainder has this property. Yes. So that proves this claim. So you want to have it for any t, and you, 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 uh, you use the fact that you can have it for any, sub for, for any, subsequent, for any sequence of tn. Yes. because uh, the limits are identified. The limit is zero. So. And having a discrete sequence is necessary to have a profile decomposition. Yes. Of course, maybe there's some other, but I mean, that's the, for a subsequence. Okay. So now we're gonna prove that E1 cannot be in S by using proposition two, and this uh, property two of the profiles. So proposition two tells me that I'm in this situation. And the first profile is substantial with the substantiality delta three. Should I, that, that's written here. It's right here. This is even a well thought out Transparency, <laughs> okay? So now I'm going to contradict this and this using these properties, okay? So I have the sequence T prime n and I use that for a subsequence, I have a profile decomposition and the profile decomposition has these properties. Now I will use the, the weak limit property that tells me that the inner product with u gives me the, the norm of the profile. And this is just a consequence of the Pythagorean expansion orthogonality of parameters. Okay. Now from our assumptions, these two assumptions, it tells me where the profile lives. It lives in this region for any alpha because the other parts are, are no not where the you know these profiles always are concentrated near the light cone once you undo the scaling and so this is where this lives okay well, you can use the radiation field or the concentration near the, the light cone, either way. Okay, now I look at this inner product and I split it into this part and the other part. The part corresponding to this gives me an error that goes to zero. And the, the rest, I just use the Cauchy-Schwartz for the inner product and I get these two things. So this is bounded by that. Now this converges to this quantity squared. So the conclusion is that this is less than epsilon. But my claim tells me that if this is less than epsilon, the S norm is less than beta and beta was delta three over two. So this is delta three over two, but the profile property two told me that it had, it had to be bigger than delta over three. So what I'm using is that if somebody gives me a sequence, for a subsequence I have a profile decomposition and I then just work with that. And my profile property two worked for any given sequence.
Okay? Is this more clear then? I will not uh, say that this is not a tricky proof. It is a tricky proof. Uh, uh, okay. So let me, let me just say that what, what I will do next time is now I will abandon the infinite time because the finite time and the infinite time behave the same way once we have this part. So this is the part that's the main difference between the finite time and the infinite time. But we've done it. So then I'm going to go to the finite time case and prove the decomposition. So that will be the last two lectures. For a sequence of times, time, yeah. <coughs> and I'll say something about how to find this sequence of time. Okay. So how close are you, do you think, to the continuous? Uh, far. <laughs> the, pardon me? Do you have some strategy, you think? Or we have several attempts, but uh, I'm not willing to say more than that. I mean, the, there's a, I think it is a very difficult question to pass. It's, it's already difficult to prove it for a sequence of times, but to pass to the general case, you need to understand collisions of solitary waves. And this is a, a very tricky thing. Okay, so that's what's... Now in the radial case, of course, you have only one solitary wave and then uh, these dispersive properties of, of solutions allow you to understand that. Okay. Very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, then for next time, so speak up. <laughs>